be inconvenient for me, my boys love it. They think it's brilliant. <laughs> They've spent a lot of time uh, splashing it everywhere you could imagine. So, but it's been it's been a good week. God has certainly turned the turned the showers on for us, and it's beautiful to see everything becoming so green. So, uh, for those of you who, who don't know, uh, my name is Luke, and uh, this morning our, our sermon will be presented by Pastor Mark, so we're looking forward to, to hearing that. Uh, and also, I'd like to just give a very warm welcome, of course, to uh, any, any guests that may be with us, to, of course, our regular members, anybody joining us in the hall who's, who's watching the live feed over there, and anyone watching the live stream, who we know there are a number of people that watch us um, here in, in Australia, but also overseas, and so we want to make sure that you're certainly very welcome to worship with us this morning. Uh, so as we get underway, a couple of things I just want to let you know for anyone who may have missed the announcement last week. This afternoon, we have a... A baptism. Praise the Lord for that. That's always one of my favorite favorite events in the in the church calendar. So uh, we have a baptism this afternoon at two thirty. So uh, for the, anybody who's able to join us for that, please come back for the baptism at two thirty. And the other thing I want to let you know about is that uh, the Lord's Supper will be held in two weeks, two weeks from now. So just to, to keep that in mind in in your own heart as you prepare and as we approach approach that day. Now. Uh, it's time for us to uh, come to our, the, the first song of our service, but I just wanted to comment on it. The, the song is uh, song number, uh, number 83, which is Oh Worship the King. Now, I like words. I like speaking them. I like writing them. But one thing that has always escaped me is the ability to, to write in verse and in song. And so sometimes when I, when I see these, uh, these hymns and just the pictures that are created within the words, uh, there's no doubt that they are inspired. And I just wanted to read from the, the first verse of O Worship the King, just to think of the picture that it paints. O worship the King, all glorious above, O gratefully sing His wondrous love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. It just presents a beautiful picture of the God that we're all here to worship today. And so I just invite you to think deeply on the lyrics to, to this hymn as, as we sing it together. So I just invite the musicians to come forward.
few musicians and singers. Uh, just uh, just a mention for anybody that is joining us via the live stream, if you have appreciated the, the ministry and the, and the music that we've been having, and I'm sure you will enjoy the, the sermon to come as we study the Word, I just invite you also to, to share this with your friends as well, so they can join in the blessing and also worship along with us. So uh, now, it, just before we have our, our prayer, just make mention of the offering boxes that are at the back there. Today's offering is for the local budget, and so that's what pays essentially for the, the running of the church and the, uh, keeps, us, keeps us going and, and worshipping here. So um, just le- letting you know about that. Uh, but also for the, the tithes that go for the, the payment of, of ministry, which, which goes on around our conference, but also further, than, further afield than that. So I just invite those of you who are able to to kneel with me now as we pray. Father, we we come before you grateful, grateful for another day of life that you have allowed us to come together to worship you in peace and safety and that we were able to learn about you. Father, I know there are many people that don't have the privileges that we have today and so whilst we are are grateful for that, we also remember those that don't have the privilege of the freedoms that we do and I I know there's still places that are unable to meet in their churches even with the the lockdowns in various locations and so I just pray that everybody that is uh, has their heart turned toward you this morning that you would lift them up, that your Holy Spirit would teach them just as you teach us today. Lord, I also pray for the other churches in our region. Lord, I pray that you would support them in their ministry and, and bring bring life to the people that are there. We think of those that aren't here today, whether it's for sickness or, or travel or whatever the causes, Lord, I ask that you would be with our, our members that are not able to be here. Please bless us as a church. Give us vision and drive to be able to take part in the vision that you have for us. Because one thing I am confident on is that the vision you have for us is even greater than the one that we have. And so we ask that you would continue to teach us and lead us and give us the opportunities and then give us the, the faith and the trust in you to step forward and take the, the best opportunity, Lord. Take, take, make use of those opportunities. We ask that you would speak through Pastor Mark this morning, that his words would be your words and that they would be ministering to us, that they would speak life, your life, into us, Lord. Please send your Holy Spirit to be our teacher and help us to be able to remain focused. And Lord, please uh, just continue to watch over our our leaders in our not only our churches, but our country as well, Lord, as we continue to navigate the very troublesome times as we approach your second coming. Lord, we look forward to that day. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for being here with us this morning. Please continue to to guide us safely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So it's now time for the children's story. And so I'm going to pass that over to Pastor. Thanks, Chris. There you go. All right. The world loves a bride. That's the saying, isn't it? All right. And we love weddings. And most of the world gets pretty fascinated by royal weddings as well, don't they? Some of you boys and girls might not remember William and Kate's wedding, probably before some of you were even born. Harry and Meghan was a bit more recent, wasn't it? Who remembers Harry and Meghan's wedding? Some. Oh, there's a few hands going up. Yeah, all right. Some of you just don't want to admit it. All right. <laughs> All right. So, our story this morning is about a royal wedding. It's a story that Jesus told to help people understand what the kingdom of heaven is like. All right. He told a story about a king who prepared a wedding feast for his son. All right. A king who had a son who was getting married. And he wanted to put on the most extravagant wedding feast that he could. And so they spent a lot of time in preparation. 
They had everything ready. And back in those days, they didn't have refrigerators and things weren't quite as tight scheduled as they are today. So they told everyone well ahead of time, the wedding's been planned. When it's ready, we'll let you know. So the wedding was ready and he sent out his servants to tell the invited guests that the wedding feast was ready. Now, back in those days, wedding feasts took a long time. It wasn't just sitting down for the afternoon and having a meal together. It would take sometimes up to a week. Lots of food, lots of feasting, lots of fellowship, right? So the, the food was all prepared. Everything was ready for this week of feasting and celebrating. And the king sent out his servants. And what do you think happened? They didn't want to come. Why would you not want to come? If you got an invitation to a royal wedding, would you go? I think I would go, just, just to experience what it was like. All these invited guests that the king had invited to the special wedding feast for his son refused to come. So the king thought to himself, maybe, maybe they misunderstood he sent out more servants and he said to them, tell those people who've been invited that everything is ready. I've prepared the feast. The animals are all slaughtered, ready to eat. Come to the wedding banquet. That was, that was the invitation. Go, make sure they understand and make sure they come. You would think this time they would come, wouldn't you? I know you boys and girls would. You'd, you'd be there because you're good boys and girls. These ones, though... Well, they just paid no attention. Some of them went off to the farm, did their work on the farm with the animals. Another one went off to his business. He was busy trying to make money and get his business established. And some, they actually took the servants who'd come to invite them and they beat them and they killed them. That's pretty sad, isn't it? They weren't very nice to do that. When the king had gone to all the trouble of preparing such a special, special banquet. So you can imagine when the king heard what had happened, was he happy? He wasn't very happy. No, in fact, he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and he burned their city to the ground. That's how angry he was. That He had gone to all the trouble to provide a feast for them and they didn't want to come. So now he had a dilemma, didn't he? He had a feast that was all prepared, lots of food, lots of empty tables and empty chairs, and no one to come and enjoy the celebration with him and his son. So he said to his servants, look, the wedding feast is ready. The ones who were invited didn't want to come. So I want you to go out into the streets, find everyone that you can and invite them to the wedding. So the servants went out into the streets and they gathered all the people they could find. There were good people, there were bad people, upright people, immoral people, and they invited them all to the wedding banquet. And it was filled with guests. Now, when the king came in, he looked around and he saw that everybody had dressed up for the wedding except for one person. One person had come and he wasn't wearing appropriate wedding clothes. What would you wear if you were going to a wedding? You'd get dressed up, wouldn't you? And some, some ladies particularly take a lot of time to choose what they're going to wear to a wedding. For men, it's a bit simpler, isn't it? We, we just put on our tie and jacket and we're ready to go. Well, this man had not taken any care at all. He just decided to rock up as he was and the king came in and saw him down here just wearing his old clothes. And he said, how did you get in here without wedding clothes on? And the man was speechless. Why do you think he was speechless? He was speechless because he actually could have put wedding clothes on if he wanted to. What we understand is that in those days, the king would provide wedding clothes for the guests. And all they had to do was put them on and wear them to the wedding. But this man, for some reason, decided he didn't want to do that. He thought coming in his own clothes was okay, and the king wasn't very happy. Why do you think you wouldn't wear nice wedding clothes to a wedding? Well, normally we get dressed up for people that we want to show respect to, don't we? 
If you were going to meet someone important, say the Prime Minister was coming to town, you'd get dressed up. Coming to church, we get dressed up because we're meeting with God and we want to show respect to God, so we wear nice clothes. So this man obviously didn't have a lot of respect for the king and uh, didn't appreciate the significance of the occasion, perhaps, but uh, he hadn't made any effort to get ready for the wedding banquet. And so the king told the attendants, tie him up, take him outside and throw him out into the darkness. Obviously it was night time by then and so the, the man was taken outside and expelled from the wedding feast. And Jesus finished his story by saying, many are invited but few are chosen. Many are invited but few are chosen. And there's lots of lessons in the story. The main one is that everybody can come to the wedding feast. Jesus wanted those people who were first invited, they, were, they represent the nation of Israel to come to the wedding, but they didn't want to come. And then he opened the invitation to all of us who aren't Jews to come to the wedding feast, to come into the kingdom, to be his people. Everyone can come and be one of God's people. That's the first message. The second one is once we get the invitation, once we're accepted uh, to be partakers of the special wedding feast, there's a little bit of preparation we need to make. All right? We want, and we'll talk about that in the sermon. So, boys, I want you to listen carefully to the sermon. We're going to explain in the sermon what that wedding garment represents and how we can put it on. Okay? So, I want you to listen really, really carefully when we get to that. Okay? Um, but for now, just remember that everybody is invited. You can come if you want to. You can be part of God's kingdom because God has invited you. All right? We have to say yes to the invitation. We'll talk about the wedding garment a bit later. Let's just have a little prayer as we close our story time together. Father in heaven, thank you for your great love for us. Thank you for the story, um, the story of a wedding feast. And we know that um, one day we'll get to sit down at a table with you and, and share a special feast together. And, and we thank you that all of us are invited. Everybody can come and it's up to us to choose whether or not we will respond. I pray for all the boys and girls here and the big people as well that we would choose yes to say yes to the invitation and be part of that wedding feast when, it, when that day arrives. We ask it please in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's, um, let's go straight into our next hymn, I think. We'll go to 522. Um, 522. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Let's... Um, Let's stand and sing this together. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. the solid rock I stand on other ground is sinking sand on other ground is sinking sand when darkness seems to fill his face I rest on his unchanging grace Just 
Well, it is, it is really good to be back with you this morning. It's been, must be four weeks since I was here last, because I've missed three. Um, the regional day was my, uh, my rostered Hinkler day. Uh, and of course, we were at St. Andrews for the regional day, and, and there was a, uh, a Gingin day on either side of that. So it's been, it's been about a month since I was here last. Um, but it's good to be back, and, and I want to pick up really where we left off. We were doing a series on uh, the radical teachings of Jesus. And there were, I told you right at the start, it was an eight-part series, and we did seven of them, and then number eight was on regional day, and so we weren't able to complete it. Um, so I, I want to do number eight, even though this is actually not the number eight that was, we were planning to do. Um, this is a different number eight. This is just a message that I just wanted to share. I wanted to, to work on it and share it with you, and I think it ties in probably a little bit better with our, um, our baptism this afternoon. So and I appreciate Luke um, getting across the, the importance of this afternoon's program, 2.30. For those of you that, that aren't aware of the time, uh, we're celebrating with Stephanie and Leslie and Shane as they take their stand for Christ, and that's going to be um, a, a really, really special occasion Stick around, or if you have to go home for lunch, come back 2.30 and we'll be able to celebrate that together. Um, so today is a high day, and we want to look this morning at, uh, at the gospel and an aspect of the gospel um, which we are referring to as election. Election. Now, some of you are already thinking, what does voting have to do with the gospel? All right? Um, and the election is still a little bit far away, so why are we even worrying about the election right now, okay? Um, not, not that election, not electing a prime minister or a state premier. Um, we'll explain what that means in just a moment, what Jesus taught about election, all right? Um, so let's, let's bow our heads, let's, let's pray to begin, and then we'll get into our, our study together. Let's, let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, almighty God, we we just bow humbly in your presence. We thank you for drawing us together this morning and thank you again for an opportunity to be in your word. Father, we just pause and ask that you would be here again through your spirit. May you be our teacher this morning. May you help us to understand this, this doctrine on which many in the Christian world are confused about. We pray that you would uh, speak to us, give us the clarity, the understanding that we need. And help us to see also its application for our own lives. Help us to live in the light of the truth from your word. We ask it, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to put some, some um, people up on the screen. Some of you won't have a clue who they are. Um, I'm curious, on actually, how many of you do recognize them, all right? So let's put the first one up. Does anybody recognize this gentleman? Yep, one. Someone else? Not many others. His name is John Piper. He's a pastor from the United States. Uh, if I was smart, I could tell you which church he pastors, but it slips my mind. Anyway, he has a ministry called Desiring God. Um, you can get on, he's got a website, YouTube channel. Um, he is very, well, I'll, I'll tell you something about all of them in a minute, but John, John Piper, Desiring God. Um, very, very... Uh, inspiring, very solid biblical preacher. Does anyone know who this gentleman is? Yeah, well, one more down the front. Anyone else know who this is? A few others? Paul Washer. All right, this is a gentleman called Paul Washer. Uh, Paul Washer uh, leads a ministry called Heart Cry um, Missionary, Heart Cry Missionary Society or something like that. 
um, was a, a, a missionary in South America for many years, now I think based in the United States. Um, again, you can see his sermons on, on YouTube, um, all over the internet, um, and a very powerful, very popular preacher, especially amongst young people in conservative circles today. Um, one more. Anybody recognize this gentleman? Yep. Other one? A few others? Yeah, John MacArthur. All right, very good. John MacArthur. Um, John MacArthur, probably one of the most prominent expository preachers of this generation. Um, again, has a church in the United States called Grace Community Church in California. Has a ministry called Grace to You. Has written countless books and very, very influential among conservative Christian circles. What do all three of these men have in common? They're not Seventh-day Adventists, that's one thing, all right? In regard to their theology, what do they all have in common? Calvinists. They're all Calvinists, all right? They're all, they're all Calvinists. They are, they, they are all very solidly biblical in their presentations. They're all conservative in the way that they address issues like music and worship, um, like, like men's and women's roles within the family and in the church. In many regards, they put us to shame in some of those areas. Um, very, very high view of God, very high view of Scripture, and a very high view of the Gospel. And for that reason, very, very attractive, very appealing to a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of Christians today, a lot of young Christians today. And, and these three and others are, are responsible for what we would call a resurgence of Calvinism. Um, the, the New Calvinists, their title. And there are other people on, on YouTube who have podcasts and things like that. That, um, that are promoting Calvinism. So what are we talking about? We're talking about Calvinism. All three of these, and there are others of their ilk, um, they all teach, believe, um, what essentially John Calvin taught many years ago. John Calvin, we have the dates there, 1509 to 1564, one of the reformers. Um, John Calvin... Um, did, did many good things. He was a great, great preacher, expository preacher, um, but was responsible for the development of, of what is, well, today it's just called Calvinism, all right? And I want to give you a quick overview of, of the five points of Calvinism, all right? This will just set us up for our Bible study in a moment, all right? Some of you will be familiar with this. Now, Calvin is, Calvin, Calvinists um, believe these five things. They believe more than just these five things, all right? They believe a lot of things. They believe the Bible and they have a slightly different view on a few things than what we do, but, but at the heart of Calvinism are these five things. Number one is, is a belief about human nature. They call it total depravity. Now, I have put up there in brackets inability because I think total inability is a better way of describing what they actually believe. If they were telling you what they believe, they would say that human nature is absolutely corrupt. There is nothing good in us by nature. Right? We would tend to agree with that at least to some extent. But in practice, what they actually mean is that because of our fallenness, because of our corruptness, we are unable to seek God. We are unable to choose God. We're unable to even respond to God. We are dead in sins and trespasses. They take that very literally. All right? So the foundation of Calvinism is a total inability on the part of humanity to, to reach out to God, to respond to God, to choose God. Because of that, God has to choose us. We cannot choose God, therefore God must choose us. Therefore, those that are saved must have been chosen by God. And that's called election. Before the beginning of time, before the beginning of this world, certainly God chose who would be saved and who would be lost. That's at the, that's at the heart of Calvinism. It's an emphasis on God's sovereignty. God is in control. God is in charge. Therefore, everything is determined by Him. There's a certain logic to it. But we'll unpack it a little bit more later on. So, so because of humanity's inability, God chooses. God chooses you or he doesn't choose you. Not everyone has chosen to be saved. Therefore, Christ did not have to die for everybody. Christ only had to die for the elect. And that is called limited atonement. Christ's sacrifice paid for the sins of those whom God chose. Those who are not chosen for salvation, Christ did not die for them. All right? You can see the logic. As I said, I'm not saying it's right, <laughs> but I'm just saying that that's the logic. We'll, 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 we'll challenge it in a moment. The next one is irresistible grace. 
God has chosen certain people for salvation. Christ has paid the price for their sins. He's atoned for their iniquities. And at some point in their lives, God bestows his grace upon them. And that grace then awakens them uh, and, and draws them to Christ for salvation. All right, And that grace is irresistible. If you're one of the chosen, if you are elect, then you will be saved. That grace will draw you and you will come to the point where you accept that salvation for yourself and the fourth one is the perseverance of the saints. Once you are saved, you cannot be lost. All right, Once saved, always saved is how we often refer to it as. Perseverance of the saints. Those who are chosen, those who are elect, need not fear uh, falling away. Their, their salvation is secure. All right? Now you can see there, if you take the first letters of each of those points, it spells tulip. All right? A five-point Calvinist is defined by these, these things. They call it um, TULIP, T-U-L-I-P, Total Depravity, Unconditional Election, Limited Atonement, Irresistible Grace, and the Perseverance of the Saints. Now, now, you and I might look at that and say, how on earth could someone who reads their Bible come to some of those conclusions? God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. You can probably think of plenty of other verses that, that imply, if not are explicitly teaching, that salvation is available to all and it rests with us to accept it. Calvinism is gaining in popularity. There is a resurgence of Calvinism in Christian circles. Those presenters that I put up there on the screen um, are very popular and, and they have a lot of good to offer. I, I uh, particularly John MacArthur, I have listened to a lot of his messages and, and I've learned a, a lot about, uh, not so much theology, but about um, exegesis and, and exposition and, and, and certainly preaching, fantastic preachers. So what do we do with this? All right? the, the question we're asking this morning is what did Jesus teach about election? How does this stack up in the light of what Jesus taught? And I want us to focus particularly this morning on the parable of the wedding feast. Let's, let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. And let's read together verses 1 to 14. Matthew 22, beginning in verse 1. Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding and they were not willing to come. Again he sent out other servants saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatted cattle are killed and all things are ready, come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully and killed them. When the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. And he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. When the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, but few are elect. That's the same word that's translated elect in other parts of the Bible, certainly in Matthew 24, where Jesus talks a number of times about the elect. All right, Matthew 24, verse 24. False Christ, false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect, the chosen ones. That's all elect means. Elect means those who are chosen. When we talk about an election, all right, a government election, it's about people choosing who will represent them. The, the ones who are elected to office are those who are chosen to fill certain positions in the government. So the elect are the chosen. When Jesus says many are called but few are chosen, he is speaking about who are elect. 
So when we're asking the question, what did Jesus teach about election? This is a pretty good place to find out. All right, so we're going to work through the parable. We'll look at it fairly quickly and we'll focus on this last scene, which helps us understand this idea of election. All right, so the first part of the story, we'll call it the invitation rejected. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. Jesus is trying to help us understand the kingdom of heaven. A little bit of context. This, this parable, Jesus is, is speaking in the, the middle of the final week of his life. This is a Wednesday. At the start of the week, he's come into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. They've waved palm branches. They've shouted, Hosanna. At the end of the week, Jesus will be crucified by those same people. This is Wednesday. The tide is starting to turn. They've, they've welcomed him in as the Messiah. They are expecting him at any moment now to launch his attack against the Romans. But he doesn't. And they're beginning to doubt the claims of Jesus. They're beginning to doubt their own understanding of Jesus and his mission. Jesus answered and spoke to them by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. And, and, and the, the, the wedding here is, is, I mean, who the son is and who the bride is, that's not mentioned. Jesus isn't trying to spell all that out for us in this parable. A wedding was a big deal in Jewish culture. And certainly a royal wedding was as big a deal as you could get. Jesus is trying to paint a picture of the, of the grandest celebration that they could imagine. A wedding feast on a grander scale than most of them had had opportunity to be part of in, in their lifetime. And some of you, as I said, you can, you can picture um, you know, Harry and Meghan's wedding. Some of you watched it. Many of you, I know, would have watched it on TV. Uh, William and Kate and even Charles and Diana, for those who are old enough to, to remember that. All the world tunes in to watch the royal wedding because it's such an extravagant event. And there's something about the pomp and the ceremony and all of that that captures our interest, captures our attention. And Jesus is, is using that picture to try and, and help us understand something about the kingdom of heaven. In verse 3 it says, He sent out his servants and called to call those who were invited to the wedding. So he's... He's calling, essentially, the already called. These are people who had received an invitation probably some months prior. They knew that the wedding was being planned. They had been invited and they were told that when everything was ready, they, they would receive a call to the wedding. Presumably, they had sent back an RSV paying, RSVP saying, yes, we'll come. They'd agreed to come. And, and, and why not? You would too, all right? Not every day you get invited to a royal wedding. And we're not told why, but for some reason, when that invitation goes out to the already called people, they refuse to come. It says at the end of verse 3, they were not willing to come to the wedding feast. Verse 4 again, he sent out other servants saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatted cattle are killed. All things are ready. Come to the wedding. The king sends out a second invitation, if you like. A second time he sends out servants telling these people that everything is ready. Please come. In verse 5, they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. This is, of course, a picture of God's invitation to Israel. Th those who were invited into the kingdom were the Jews. They were the chosen ones. They were the already invited ones. And when Jesus comes as the Messiah, who do the disciples first go to? They go to first to the Jews. Jesus says, don't go to the other, the other cities, the other places around. Go first to the, the house of Israel, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They're the ones that we want to invite into the kingdom. And in verses 5 and 6, it says there are, there are two types of responses. There are those who are indifferent, 
those who went away to their farm and to their business, and there were those who were hostile. And Jesus encountered that, and we, we do too today, don't we? There are those who are indifferent. They really don't care, and they would probably be the, the secular ones. Even back in Jesus' day, there were secular Jews and there were religious Jews. The secular people are not interested. They're just busy with their stuff. Busy with their farms, their enterprises, their businesses. B busy with the affairs of life. And they don't have time for God. They don't have time for religion. And then there are the religious people. And in Jesus' day, it was the religious leaders who led the hostilities. And in the parable, it says, the rest, they seized his servants, treated them spitefully and killed them. And that was somewhat prophetic. John the Baptist had already been killed. Jesus was about to be crucified. And if you go through the list of apostles, the list of martyrs, all of them, except for John, were martyred for their ministry, for sharing the gospel. So the first part of this parable, the invitation rejected, it's a picture of Israel's rejection of the Messiah, Israel's rejection of the gospel that the apostles brought to them at, at the time of Jesus. Verse 7, it says, When the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. The rejectors punished. Now, for, for those who were listening... You, you can imagine the struggle in their minds. First of all, you know, first of all, it's probably, probably certain that they understood that Jesus was talking about them. All right? but it says that back in chapter 20, 21, that they understood that Jesus was talking about them. Um, but, but if they stuck with the story, if they just stuck with the story of a royal banquet that the king had prepared, and it, it was just inconceivable that people would choose not to come. Certainly inconceivable that they would take the servants and treat them spitefully and kill them. And so when, when they hear the next part of the story, that this king was furious, he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers and burned up the city, they were probably thinking to themselves, well, that's fair enough. That would make sense. Even in our culture, murder is, well, they're not executed, but they're certainly locked up for a long time, aren't they? But Jesus is speaking about them, isn't he? He's speaking about the fate that awaits them. He's speaking about the fate that awaits them. And of course, this was fulfilled not too many years later. Jesus says there that he sends out his armies, destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. 70 AD, Titus Vespasian, the Roman general, came to Jerusalem and conquered the city. Murdered one million 100,000 Jews threw their bodies over the wall and slaughtered beyond that multiple thousands outside all around Palestine. Josephus, who was an eyewitness to the whole thing, wrote in his History of Jewish War these words, he translated of course, that building, the temple at Jerusalem, however, God long ago had sentenced to the flames, but now in the revolution of the time periods, the fateful day had arrived, the tenth of the month of Luz, the very day on which previously it had been burned by the king of Babylon. One of the soldiers, neither awaiting orders nor filled with horror of so dread an undertaking, but moved by some supernatural impulse, snatched a brand from the blazing timber and hoisted up by one of his fellow soldiers, flung the fiery missile through a golden window. When the flame arose, a scream as poignant as the tragedy went up from the Jews now that the object which before them, sorry, before they had guarded so closely was going to ruin. While the sanctuary was burning, neither pity for age nor respect for rank was shown. On the contrary, children and old people, laity and priests alike, were massacred. The emperor had ordered the entire city and sanctuary to be razed to the ground except only the highest towers and that part of the wall that enclosed the city on the west. And that's, of course, the Western Wall that still stands today. The invitation was rejected and, and, and the king sends his armies in the story to punish those murderers and burn up their city, fulfilled literally AD 70 when the Roman army came and destroyed the city of Jerusalem. 
Verse 8, the story continues. There are new guests invited, and he says to his servants, The wedding is ready. Those who are invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. You can imagine the scenario. You've prepared a massive banquet. There's food prepared, and of course, there's no refrigeration. You can't just put everything on ice, put it back in the freezer. There's a celebration to be had. There's a meal to be shared. There's a feast to be enjoyed. And so the king says, go out into the highways and find anyone you can. Invite them to the wedding. Invite them to the wedding. And so the servants went out, verse 10, into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. The invitation now goes out to everybody. The, the status that Israel had as the chosen people of God, the privileged people of God, has come to an end. And the gospel now goes to the Gentiles. It goes beyond the borders of Israel and is and it's extended to everybody. Everybody who will come is invited to the wedding feast. Verse 11, when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. The final scene is the intruder expelled. There is an assessment, I guess, that takes place. The king comes in, I guess, to see if everybody's having a good time to come and join in the festivities. And he sees there a man who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And the man, of course, was speechless. The king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. Many are invited. Everybody, in fact, is invited. That's really the point of the story. Everybody is invited, but few are elect. Now, how do we reconcile that? An invitation that is extended to everybody who will come, and yet Jesus says, very clearly in verse 14, there are only a few who are chosen, only a few who are, who are elect, to use the terminology that, that our Calvinist friends like to use. How do we make sense of all of this? Well, let's, let's just come back to this last part of the story. All right? we, we see there that the invitation is extended to everybody, both good and bad. So it's not about who deserves to come. All right? that, that's really important from the outset. They're not looking just for the upright, just for the moral, just for the, the citizens who have, I don't know, shown themselves to be above the others. The king tells them to go out and find anybody they can and they invite both good and bad. The moral, the immoral, the criminals, the upstanding citizens. They're all invited to come. The issue is not so much then who is invited, but how the invitation is responded to. And, and that's where this wedding garment comes into the story. It's not clear in the story, and scholars debate whether or not these people had time to go home and get their wedding clothes on or whether, in fact, the king provided a wedding garment for the guests. If you read Christ's Object Lesson, Alan White says very clearly that a wedding garment was provided for the guests. I think we can assume that that was the case. So the question then is, why did this one individual come in without wearing the garment that had been given? That's a hard question to answer, isn't it? Because, again, we're not told. All we are told is that the fact that he did not have it on meant that he could not stay at the banquet. The fact that he did not have it on meant that he could not stay at the banquet. He was invited and he had responded to the invitation by turning up to the wedding feast, but he had not made the appropriate preparation. 
He had not made the appropriate preparation. Now, we want to try and unpack some of this. What does a wedding garment represent? How do we put it on? What, what does that tell us about this appropriate preparation? And how does that all impact what it means to be chosen or elect? All right, so let's, let's see if we can work through this a little bit. First of all, what does the garment represent? Some of you will have Isaiah 61.10 in your mind already, all right? Isaiah 61 verse 10 I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. And, and we would conclude, I think, quite naturally, that the garment somehow represents righteousness. A garment provided by the king, symbolizing the righteousness that God has provided for his people. Make sense? All right. We see something similar in the book of Job. Job 29 and verse 14. Job says, I put on righteousness and it clothed me. Now there is a little difference though between what we saw in Isaiah and what we see in Job. Isaiah says, he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me in a robe of righteousness. Job says, I put on righteousness and it clothed me. Now you might say, well that's just splitting hairs. But I think you'll see that there's something that Something significant about putting on the garment, all right? Um, what, what do we understand about righteousness in Matthew's gospel? This is really, really important. Um, we can go back to, to the Sermon on the Mount, and we, we spent some time in this passage some years ago, um, and I can remember preaching on, on this particular verse, Matthew 5 and verse 20. Jesus starts off the Sermon on the Mount by saying to his hearers, I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. All right, G Jesus is saying that if you are going to enter the kingdom, remember this parable, Matthew 22, Jesus is talking about the kingdom, He's trying to explain to them the kingdom. So there is a connection here. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, for the, for the listeners, the hearers in, in Matthew 5, that would have been absolutely demoralizing. Because for most people, the scribes and the Pharisees were as righteous as a person could get. They were the benchmark. They were the standard. But Jesus rejected their righteousness because as far as he was concerned, it was simply external. It was simply about ticking certain boxes paying a certain amount of money into the offering and making sure everyone could see it, standing on the street corners and praying loud prayers, making sure that everybody could hear. And Jesus says, look, it has to go deeper than that. Just because you're not killing people doesn't mean you're fulfilling the righteousness of the law. If you're angry with your brother, you have sinned and are accountable to God. And, and he went on, and you, you, you're familiar with that, I think. So Jesus is, is talking here about a practical righteousness. You, you must have a, a righteousness that works from the inside out. A, a transforming righteousness, a manifest righteousness. It's more than just something that, that you can pass off to others um, as, as, as appropriate. Matthew 7, 21, Jesus goes on. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Same, same idea, same theme. Who is going to be able to enter the kingdom of heaven? Not just those who say, but those who do. Doing the will of God. Doing the will of God is a key theme in Matthew's gospel. Not just Matthew's gospel, though. Paul, Paul says similar things as well. 1 Corinthians 9, 6 and verse 9, Paul says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Well, if we followed the teachings of Jesus, we would know that, wouldn't we? we have to, there has to be a certain righteousness. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Are they invited? They're invited, aren't they? What has to happen for those kinds of people to be able to enter the kingdom of God? <laughs> they need to become righteous, all right? 
Paul goes on to say, such were some of you. He's writing to the Corinthians. You were like that. But you accepted the invitation and you put on the garment. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. This garment of righteousness, it's not simply something that is forensic. It's not just a a legal declaration. The righteousness that transformed these people that Paul is talking to, from thieves and covetous and drunkards and revilers to, to, to citizens of the kingdom... It is is a transformative power that God works in their lives. Manifest righteousness. It's the holiness that Paul talked about in Hebrews 12, 14, without which no one will see the Lord. I want to to share with you, I don't don't like to quote theologians too much in sermons, but um, there's a a series of books came out some years ago. Um, You might be familiar with these, some of you might have these on your bookshelves. The Bible Amplifier series. The General Conference put them out. The plan was to go through the whole Bible and make it basically a a full set, but it didn't get completed. Um, George Knight wrote the one on on Matthew's Gospel, and I just want to quote a couple of paragraphs from it because I think he's speaking about this parable of the wedding garment, and and he captures the essence, I think, pretty well. He says, A great deal of discussion has taken place as to the exact nature of the wedding garment. It seems to me, this is George Knight in his commentary speaking, seems to me that F.D. Bruner is correct when he writes that, quote, the wedding garment in the context of Matthew's gospel is not passive, imputed Pauline righteousness. This is not just a legal declaration. It's not just a right standing with God that is given to the people. All right. In contrast, it is active, moral, Matthew, and as in the type of righteousness that Matthew keeps writing about, righteousness. Matthew 5, 20 he cites, which is one we've looked at already. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. It is doing God's will. 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. It is evidence of repentance by law-abiding discipleship. That is the kind of righteousness that Matthew is talking about that Jesus is talking about here in this story that interpretation is in line with Revelation 19 8 which tells us that the fine linen of the redeemed is the righteous deeds of the saints the righteous deeds of the saints but Bruner is careful to caution us that the wedding gown must not be confused with a dreary legalism It should be noted, he writes, that the wedding garment of personal righteousness was not necessary in order to be invited to the party. Both good and bad were invited, but the garment of personal righteousness was necessary in order to stay at the party. Once again in Matthew, we find that doing God's will is important. A person in a faith relationship with Jesus will be a doer of God's will. Faith is not mere mental assent that Jesus is Lord, it is living the life of Christ. That's what Jesus taught. And in Matthew's gospel, this idea of righteousness is personal righteousness. It is manifest righteousness. It is doing right, it is speaking right, it is thinking right. That's what the garment represents. That's what the garment represents. If, if it is living the life of Christ, how do we put it on? All right? How do we put on the garment? I want to I share with you a couple of, and I don't want to confuse Paul's theology with Matthew's theology, but I think there's some instructive things we can look at here, right? Romans 13, verse 12. What does Paul say? You're probably familiar with this. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly, as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and evil. What's what's Paul calling for? He's calling for personal righteousness, holiness, a holy, righteous walk with God. That's that's the idea. Notice what he says next. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. What is the garment? The righteousness of Christ. It is putting on Christ. It's putting on Christ. That's what Paul's talking about. How, how do we do that? 
If we want to live the life of Christ, we want to put on Christ, put on this garment of righteousness, where does it start? Galatians 3.27, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have what? Have put on Christ. That's where it starts. It starts with making a commitment, making a decision to accept Jesus as Lord, to embrace the gift of salvation, to receive all that he's offering. That's putting on the garment, putting on Christ. It starts with being baptized. Does it end there? Does it end there? Let's go to Colossians. Colossians 3. Now, now that you've been baptized, now that you've come to Christ, you, you, you're right with God. You've been reconciled to Him. You have a right standing with God. Now you yourselves are to put off all of these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. You put off the unrighteous deeds, the unrighteous practices, the unrighteous habits of your past life. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. You are putting on Christ. All right, You are being transformed into the image of Christ by putting on the new man. It's, it's a word picture and it pictures someone putting on a garment. But it's active. Therefore, and this is interesting for us, isn't it? Therefore, as the what? The elect, the chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. As many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. It starts there. Putting on the garment starts with committing our lives to Christ, taking that step of baptism, being united with Him and receiving His, his righteousness through justification. But then there is the righteousness that is in parted to us through sanctification. We have a responsibility to, to put on the positive traits of character, put on all those things we just listed there. Tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, choosing to cultivate the mind of Christ. Ultimately characterized by love. Love for our brothers and sisters in the church. Love even for our enemies outside in the community. Put on love which is the bond of perfection. Who then are the elect? Who then are the elect? Remember the text? Many are called, but few are chosen. The invitation goes out to everybody. Come to the banquet, come to the feast. Everything is prepared. Many are called. Everyone is called, but few are chosen. Few are elect. Let me share with you a statement from Patriarchs and Prophets. The gifts of His grace through Christ are free to all. Page 207, 208. There is no election but one's own by which any may perish. God has set forth in his word the conditions upon which every soul will be elected to eternal life, obedience to his commandments through faith in Christ. God has elected a character in harmony with his law. And anyone who shall reach the standard of his requirement will have an entrance into the kingdom of glory. Christ himself said, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life. Emphasis, of course, being on anyone. It is open to all who will believe, who, all who will meet the conditions. She quotes Matthew 7, 21, which we've seen already. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And in Revelation he declares, Blessed are they that do his commandment, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. 
As regards man's final salvation, this is the only election brought to view in the word of God. Every soul is elected who will work out his own salvation with fear and trembling. He is elected who will put on the armor, of, on the armor and fight the good fight of faith. He is elected who will watch under prayer, who will search the scriptures and flee from temptation. He is elected who will have faith continually, who will be obedient to every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The provisions of redemption are free to who? Free to all. They are free to all. The results of redemption will be enjoyed by those who have complied with the conditions. So who are the elect? You are. You are if you choose to be. If you choose to be. Provision has been made for all. The sacrifice of Christ was sufficient for all. Every man, woman and child, every one of you sitting here, every person out there in the community of Bundaberg and across Australia and all around the world, Christ's sacrifice was sufficient. It was enough. Your debt was paid. My debt was paid. Your neighbor, your colleague, everybody. Everybody has opportunity to come into the kingdom. It rests with us to choose how we will respond. Will we put on Christ? And praise God, there are three candidates this afternoon who are taking their stand in baptism, who are choosing to put on Christ through that act of baptism. And for those of us that have taken that stand, put on tender mercies, kindness, and all those other things that are listed there, the, the character qualities that stand out in the life of Christ, make them your own. And above all, put on love. Because ultimately it's love that distinguishes those who are Christ from those who are not. Who are the elect? You and me if we choose to be. All right? We're going to sing, we're going to sing in closing, 216. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. All right? That's a decision that all of us can make. We can all be part of the kingdom if we choose to take hold of the provision that has been given to us. Put on that garment that's been provided through us, through Christ. Let's stand and sing together.
But Father in heaven, we long for that day when your chosen ones will be gathered to their home beyond the skies. Father, we've learned this morning that to be one of your chosen ones is not dependent upon some arbitrary decision that was made in eternity past, but it depends upon our reception of the gift. We've seen, Lord, in your word that many have been invited, many meaning all, all here this morning, all out in our community have been invited. And the reason that only few are chosen, that few are elect, is because so few are willing to receive the gift. So few are willing to take the garment of salvation, the robe of righteousness, and put it on, to put on Christ, to put on his character, and be transformed to be like him. Father, we want that. We want that to be our experience. Father, may we settle for nothing less. May you draw us to yourself day by day, moment by moment. May you you set our eyes upon Jesus, that by beholding him we may become changed. May you give us courage to make the decisions that we need to make, to make some of those hard choices. To to bring ourselves into harmony with, with you and your will. To be conformed to the likeness of Christ. Work your work in us, we pray. Continue your work till that day when Jesus comes. And we can stand together and celebrate together the marriage supper of the Lamb. We ask it please in Jesus' name. Amen.